So when you die without a will, your spouse is entitled to the first 350000 So if you died without a will and you were married and your estate was total value 300000 then it, even if you had children, it's all going to go to the spouse because it's under three fifty. Hello, I am Celia Sanka, Executive Director of the Diversity Canada Foundation, the organization that brings you GoldenVoices.com, the website where seniors gather to focus on issues of concern to seniors, and where we find the Golden Years Fireset Chat the series under the theme Living Longer and Living Well. Today's topic is one that becomes more and more important to us as we grow older, and that's legal issues around estate planning and uh, drafting up a will. We are quite privileged to have uh, as our guest today, Adam Capelli, who will help us understand those issues much better. Adam is the co-founder of the law firm Cambridge LLP, which has offices across Ontario, including here in Elliott Lake, where Diversity Canada is based. Um, Adam himself works out of the Burlington office. Is that correct, Adam? That is correct, Celia. Yes, the Burlington office where he is managing partner of the Estates Group. And the Estates Group of that law firm focuses on estate planning, estate administration, and estate litigation, which is something that nobody uh, likes at all. <laughs> so, uh, Adam has been working in this field for the last two decades and has been certified by the Law Society of Ontario as a specialist in estates and trust law. And his professional experience inspired him to produce uh, and host a popular local television show, Airs and Omissions. Not heirs, but heirs, as in those who inherit. And it's a play in the word, Arizona <laughs> mission. That's a legal, legal insider joke. And uh, Adam also taught estate planning in the MBA program at McMaster University for several years. So uh, we indeed are privileged to have you uh, share with us uh, knowledge and information on, around estates and um, planning for that stage of life. Uh, thank you, Celia. That was a very uh, kind introduction. A couple of one correction and and uh, one update. Um, you used the word popular uh, with respect to my show. That's very flattering. I don't know how popular uh, it was. And <clears throat> this this last season we rebranded from errors and emissions to legal ease. And uh, essentially, the program went from focus only on estates and trust to topical legal issues uh, so we covered you know the complete cross-section from real estate to constitutional law to family law uh, and we had a show on estates as well so there was a bit of rebranding and it's now called legalese legalese again another pun exactly <laughs> <laughs> you love your puns maybe you, know, you get, get some of that fun in law so you, you really <laughs> have to make you know your own uh, yes. your own um, hobbies Okay, great. So, well, this is not, uh, we'll start off with something that's not much fun. And that is, uh, um, we're talking about estate planning, but what if someone doesn't plan? What happens uh, to the person's assets without a will? Well, that's a, a really good question. And um, the one that's usually on the forefront of a lot of uh, people's minds. The, the good news is, uh, there's a myth out there that if you die without a will, that everything goes to the government. Okay, that's not true, uh, and I'll give you some details in a minute. But the other uh, point to make is that I like to say that if you die without a will, don't worry, sleep easy, because the Ontario government has written one for you. So um, there is a, a legislated formulaic. Uh, uh, distribution of your estate when you die without a will and it basically says if if you're married uh, and you have no children and that means legally married not common law at least for the time being in Ontario that your estate 
whatever's left after payment of your taxes and debts will all pass to the surviving spouse, legally married spouse. If you're married and you have a child, then the, the estate is split equally between that child and your spouse. And so some people might say, well, that's great. I don't have a will, but I have, I'm married and I have a child, so it's all good. I, I love them both and they're going to be treated equally. The problem is they're not treated equally. Um, there's what's called a, a preferential share that goes to um, the surviving uh, spouse. When you die without a will, your spouse is entitled to the first 350000 So if you died without a will and you were married and your estate was total value 300000 then it, even if you had children, it's all going to go to the spouse because it's under three fifty. And if there's more than 350000 Then the balance is split equally. And then some might say, well, that's fine too, but the, it's not quite that easy. Um, if you have a if if the child is under the age of 18, then uh, that assets have to be liquidated, and that money actually has to be paid into court, and it's managed by the government for that child. So that's that's the good news. The province has written a will for you, and and in nowhere in the will does it say, oh, and by the way, the province gets one tenth. No, they don't get anything, but they do get some increased uh, tax revenues in the form of income taxes or higher when you die without a will uh, for reasons that are beyond the scope of the show and and there's also a probate fee that would be levied on the entire value of your estate uh, if you die without a will and you haven't planned your affairs properly. So that was a, a full rich answer and lots to think about. Um, something you've mentioned uh, in your answer you indicated a common, not a common law, but an uh, actual legal spouse. Um, there's a difference with uh, between a common law spouse and uh, a legal spouse when it comes to passing yes. on without a will. Yes, there certainly is. Again, common misconception that uh, you live with someone and they're considered your common law spouse and they're on the same level of uh, rights as a, a legally married spouse and that is incorrect if you are legally married you have statutory rights um, in an estate if you are not legally married then you have to establish that you um, contributed to the you know the deceased estate in some way you know, the old origins of this rule go back to a case that involved, I don't want to a, date the case and, and be incorrect, I'm going to say probably 50, I don't even want to put an age on it because my classmates will say, boy, you don't remember that famous case from property law? But essentially it was born out of the typical, um, you know, this was a husband and wife who were farmers, never were married, uh, but were together for an extended period of time, let's say four years, and you know the husband earned and took all the revenue from farming and kept it in his own name and then died and here he had his for all intents and purposes his spouse with whom he was not legally married uh, left with nothing and the law right away saw that that was incredibly unfair she had contributed to his ability to farm she had maintained the farm she did his laundry she cooked his meals this was a, a very traditional household um, you know, her occupation, for lack of a better way to describe it, would be a housewife. And so, therefore, that was the origin of uh, common law claims. But, you know, the estate had to be litigated. And, and uh, so now today, everybody's looking to establish, who's not married, um, that they contributed to the growth of the estate. They enabled the person to accumulate wealth by supporting them in some shape, uh, whether it was by labor or by financial means. And so it's a much more difficult claim to make. The legal you know, way to describe it is, we describe it in law as a constructive trust claim or an unjust enrichment claim. And you're into litigation and you don't want to be in that realm. So common law, oh, and the other thing to remember too is, you know, it's not one year to establish a common law relationship, it's three years. And it's three years 
cohabitating together in a relationship that resembles marriage. So, you know, you people think, well, I, you know, my friend is moving in and I'm charging him rent, so he's a tenant. Well, if your tenant sleeps with you and enjoys dinners with you and vacations with you, you can call it what you want. It doesn't get past the, what we call, substance prevails over form. Okay, what is it really? I don't care what you call it or what you try and paper it as. What is it in reality? So it's a three-year uh, duration unless you have a child together. If you have a child together, then it, you're bumped up to the date of the child's birth. You're considered common law. So it's not like six months. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of clients will freak out. They'll say, oh my goodness, I moved in with somebody three months ago and now they're my spouse, right? And the answer is no. The other thing is there, the law is being massaged constantly in this area where you, know, you can establish, even if you live in separate cities, but there was good reason for residing in separate cities. Maybe the job that you had uh, required you to be in a separate city so you still didn't live under the same roof consistently for three years, but you were commuting back and forth. So I don't want to get into all the gradations and variations on in uh, subtleties in the, in, of the facts in these cases. But just, you know, for our viewers' knowledge, uh, they got to think about the three year and they're not on the same level, uh, even after the three years. Someone who is common law is it's not totally hopeless but there are big hurdles to um, surmount exactly to be a beneficiary having a, a will is important that's going to erase a lot of problems Uncertainty, for yeah. those you love that are left behind but there's some people who say i'm not rich enough to have a will uh, is there like an amount at which it then becomes with the trouble to prepare a will? Oh, that's a, a really good question. Um, you know, as a lawyer, we want to take the safe route and never say, you know, you're not worth it uh, to have a, it's not worth it to have a will um, or the expense. And we can talk about fees and all those good things. Um, you know, I think with a lot of clients, they forget, uh, they think, well, I have everything in joint names. So if I die, you're right, it'll pass seamlessly to the surviving owner. The only thing they're not thinking about is dying together uh, in a common accident, which can happen, and or in close succession. One dies, uh, the other, um, you know, unfortunately doesn't live very long, uh, but never gets around to changing their will. And then lo and behold, the the survivor passes and so that joint ownership was only good for a brief period of time so and then a lot of people forget that you know um uh you know their estate might be entitled to money through insurance that hits the estate after you're gone uh you know so i don't really want to set uh a minimum dollar amount but let's just talk about some basic things like disposing of your body is an executor uh, right uh, without a will causes problems when there's uh, family members that don't see eye to eye and in instructing the funeral a home um, and uh, other death benefit rights like for Canada pension filing tax returns I mean you need to have a, a legal representative named to step into your shoes to clean up whatever remaining uh, issues need to be tidied up and so therein lies the reason to have a will at the very basic level. So it's not just financial it's actually logistics that a will would help with. That's right. So when we're, when we're talking about uh, having a will uh, let's say someone realizes okay this is important I must get this done can they then just type it up on the computer, print it out, sign it, and say, here, I've done it. Yes, they can. And um, now you're going to reveal, uh, on this shoulder we have this little angel lawyer, and on this shoulder we have this little devilish lawyer in red. Okay, so the angel says, yes, you can do that. And it's a very cost-efficient way of dealing with things, and something is better than nothing. 
than this devilish lawyer over here in a red outfit with a cape, you know, the kind horns coming out of the head. That lawyer is saying, please do that because uh, we know from experience that nine times out of ten, you're going to mess it up. And when you mess it up, then you're calling um, our office to help solve the problem. And that's called litigation. And that drives a lot more revenue than planning. So, you know, the good Adam lawyer says, save money, all, more money than, than you'll save. Uh, get, it, get it professionally done so that you save not messing it up and costing your estate more money through litigation. Um, there are strict formalities that have to be followed. Those formalities have been relaxed to a certain degree with the COVID Emergency Measures Act in, in terms of allowing people to witness wills through video conferencing. But, uh, you know, you still need witnesses present at the same time. You need to be... In, a lot of times you need to sanitize the whole arrangement because... If a child who's inheriting is present or a friend who's inheriting is present, then you're leaving open the will for attack that they were too persuasive or, you know, pressuring the person to do certain things. So, you know, I, in the heart of my heart of hearts, I don't recommend people doing it themselves. But in the situation where you said, you know, they don't, they have a very modest, modest estate and it's not controversial. They want to download a form. All I can say is follow the small print, make sure you execute it properly with two witnesses and it, it'll probably be pretty good. I've um, also heard of something called a holographic will. What is that? A holographic will is, is uh, somewhat unique. Uh, in that it's not valid in every jurisdiction, but in Ontario it is. And all it's, uh, really what it is, is it's better than a, a downloaded will because a lot, a lot of these will sites are now charging for those downloads, um, realizing the demand is, is great given the uh, population, percentage of population that does not have any plan in place. But a holographic will is a will that is entirely in your own handwriting. So that doesn't mean uh, it has to be in cursive form. It can be printed. The, po the point is, is it has to be provable that the, that the person who made it actually did it in their own hand-printed, handwritten uh, form. So you can't say to your niece, oh, write this down. This is my will. And then they write it down and then you sign it. Well, you violated the rule. So that's not a valid will. Then you need two witnesses. So if it, it, it's designed, you know, it became law uh, during during periods of, uh, like the war, for example. Um, uh, a sailor going down with the ship couldn't call a lawyer or meet with a lawyer. So they wanted to give the opportunity for those that were in peril to make their final wishes known. And... Uh, Again, it's not the best way to deal with matters that are controversial. You know, there was a famous case in Canada, I remember from law school, um, where there was a Saskatchewan farmer who um, was out in, you know, uh, you know, a couple miles from home farming his cornfield and the tractor broke down and he decided to get underneath the tractor and try and repair it. It slipped into gear and the fender impaled him and he was bleeding to death and crying out to no avail. No one could hear him. And in his final moments thought he was going to, to pass and he took his own blood and inscribed it on the fender of the tractor saying, I leave everything to Ellie. Ellie was his common law spouse. There in giving great meaning to, you know, you know, if it was his married spouse, he wouldn't have needed to do that. It all would have passed to her. Or if he had children, maybe he didn't want to split it with his wife and children. The point is, is that it was a valid holographic will. It was in his own handwriting. There's no legislation that says it has to be in ink. It was in his own blood. And it scribed on the fender of a tractor, not on a, uh, you know, traditional piece of paper. And it was an expression of his final wishes. 
and it was signed by himself. So he knew, I don't know how, uh, he knew the law of holographic wills. And that fender is apparently displayed in the University of Saskatchewan uh, Law School. So it's a, a stark reminder of the power of a holographic will. Thank you. That was a very touching, very moving story. Yeah, morbid, but with a good ending. So for someone who has determined that I'm going to get this done, um, either holographic will, which probably isn't the best, um, or I'm going to approach a lawyer to help me, uh, where should someone start? What do we have to first think about when we're engaging in estate planning? It's important uh, for those of our viewers who are not you know, consulting a lawyer in our office, for instance, and may see another lawyer. The first litmus test, in my view, of paying, you know, getting good value for what you pay for uh, when you're hiring a lawyer to help you with your estate planning is you want to know that they're asking all of the information. And so you should be completing a questionnaire before you see a lawyer that, that illustrates, you know, that the lawyer's doing their their due diligence and understanding all your subtleties and circumstances to make sure you're properly planned. You want to have a questionnaire that talks about, you know, who are your family members, even if they're not inheriting. Uh, have you been married once, twice, three times? Do you have a separation agreement? Are you a member of a pension plan? Do you own assets outside of Ontario? So there should be a comprehensive questionnaire that you are required to complete that informs the lawyer before the meeting of your entire situation. So once that questionnaire is reviewed, then you're in a position to engage in a discussion about who should get your assets and, and why. You always have to document rationale. I hadn't even thought about that uh, the lawyer needs to look at who yeah. and uh, your history. Uh, I was also thinking about in terms of uh, doing a, an inventory of yes. what you own. Yeah, and that's in the question, that should be in the questionnaire. What do you own? How do you own it? What's its approximate value? Because different assets have different income tax attributes. Um, and so it's important to have all those details. And you know, um, that tells you that the person that's interviewing you is familiar, very familiar with how to properly plan. So you have to have a full and thorough understanding of what, what you have and who is in the, in the picture to either inherit or um, to be left out. On that note, um, even if you do have a will, it can be set aside. So oh, your wishes may not actually be honored by the court system. Yeah, that that is, um, uh, I think, pretty widely misunderstood as well. Um, the challenging a will or setting aside a will is a very difficult uh, case to advance. Um, basically, you need to, you can strike down a will if you can prove uh, <clears throat> any one of these things. If you can prove the person lacked the mental, capa mental capacity to make the will. So uh, that's a very high level of competency required. A lot of people think, well, my grandpa could sign his name and he knew who won the World Series in 1958. No, that's that's not the test for legal capacity. You have to know what you own, its nature, uh, so you'd have to be able to say, hey, I own a house, I don't own a house, uh, I have an RSP, uh, I have a savings account at this bank. Um, so you have to know what you own. You have to know its approximate value. You know, a lot of clients, you know, they don't necessarily look at their statements religiously every month when they come in the mail or they're someone else is helping them with their banking they have to have an idea of approximate value some clients I've interviewed will say when I say okay what what do you think your house is worth they'll say uh, about 300 
Now, that might be a lucky guess if it's worth 300,000. But if I ask them, 300 what? Somebody who's suffering from dementia can't answer that question, if you can believe it. Everybody's different. Levels of capacity are different. And if I put forward a suggestion like $300, sometimes they'll say yes. And now I know there's a disconnect. They can't appreciate value. Okay? Uh, and in other cases, 300 makes no sense because their place is worth 10 million. Then you know that the 300, whether you convert it to dollars or uh, $300 or 300,000 or 300 million, it doesn't work. So you have to know approximate values, what you own. You have to know who your um, expected inheritors are. So even though you don't like your son, Billy, you'd have to be able to know Billy exists and you'd have to be able to uh, formulate a reason for excluding Billy. If your reason is Billy's the chairperson of a satanic cult and Billy's not, uh, now you have to be able to verify some information when clients tell you, but if, if grandpa's suffering a delusion, either through mental illness or through dementia or some other impairment, you have to be able to, to distinguish Okay, because there's an old saying, uh, you know, in law that, you know, eccentric behavior is not uh, crazy behavior. So, you know, you can't say because someone is, is eccentric in their views and their wishes that they're not competent. Testamentary freedom is, <clears throat> is one of the greatest freedoms we enjoy under our legal system. So... Um, you have to be careful. Now, I digress. I was saying, you know, you have to know what you own, its approximate value, and who your family members are, who your inheritors are, and why you're including and excluding those those beneficiaries. Do you have to know their dates of birth? No. But, you know, you, you have to know that your son, Bob, is older than your daughter, Sarah, um, when you're giving that information. So that's uh, more or less the test. So if you're not incapable, uh, it's hard to set aside that will. Okay. Um, the other thing is, um, uh, the other basis to set aside is if you didn't follow the proper formalities. We talked about downloading a will and if you don't have it properly witnessed, uh, or if you didn't sign it, We've had lots of cases where the person went to the extent of writing it out. It didn't look like they were unduly influenced. It looked like <clears throat> they were cogent in their thought process. And they gave all this detail, and then they didn't sign it. Well, you can't just manufacture a signature. So, you know, failing to follow formalities is a, 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 a ground. And there have been cases, believe it or not, on knowledge and understanding. So the most popular recent case was a lawyer not conversant in the uh, Italian language uh, was in interviewing and taking instructions primarily from one of the children of the deceased. Then when they interviewed the deceased, they discussed generally what the will said and then had them sign it. And the, the will was set aside because the person's <clears throat> second language was English. Uh, they couldn't have possibly read and understood it and there was no evidence to show that they did understand it. So language barrier is is an inhibitor to knowledge and understanding of the contents. So you have to be able to prove and usually it's the lawyer that's the one that has to prove that the client knew what the will said. So knowledge and understanding is another ground. So it's not very easy. The other one is undue influence. And there you have to you have to demonstrate that there was a power position and a vulnerable position in the equation. So the typical example is caregiver looking after uh, a person who's on their deathbed and who's um, probably capable, like mentally capable. But if, if the caregiver is saying, uh, "Look, you know, your kids are three thousand miles away," and I don't really like the job I'm doing looking after you, so you better give me a hundred grand or I'm going to quit and good luck finding someone. Well, you know, 
And I'm just making this up. This is not, there may be a case like this. I'm just trying to give you an example that you have a person who's vulnerable, you have a person who's in a position of authority and who's threatening them. And so then they call the lawyer and the lawyer comes in, drafts a will and the, person, the caregiver gets a hundred grand. If you're able to establish that that was, you know, a, a highly pressured instruction given to the lawyer, then you can set aside that gift. But there are wills that are made that are completely um, smelling of, of undue influence that have been set aside. Very difficult, though. Those cases are few and far between. So to answer your question, it's very difficult. Uh, the courts respect your wishes. The, if I were to put forward another, you know, kind of a fifth way to challenge a will, there have been wills that have been set aside on the basis that they are so grossly... Um, offensive that, you know, if you're going to leave a gift to a group, uh, provided they um, commit a crime uh, or they further uh, publicize views that are, that are not in accord with we as a free and democratic society view as proper, then the court's not going to uphold that kind of will. You know, there are lots of racially motivated will plans that have been struck down, uh, religiously motivated wills that have been struck down. So, <clears throat> you know, those those types of uh, wishes, testamentary freedom is is not free. Your will will be respected once it uh, falls into uh, that category, confirms it conforms. Um, now you mentioned earlier about taxes. So when you, when someone passes on, it's not just the beneficiaries get that get um, some of the what's left behind the estate. Um, tell us a bit more about what type of taxes and what other um, aspects are covered that comes out of the estate and does is not available to the beneficiaries. Okay, there's there's two basic taxes that apply. The first one is a probate tax, and it's basically the province's tax, also known as a probate fee, charged by the court in order to validate your will, which is a process called probate. So when you die, the bank has money in your name, and you your executors want the bank to give them the money. The bank says, well, as soon as you get probate, we'll give you the money. That means sending the will to the court. It means that nobody's challenging the will. It confirms that it was properly signed. And the court will then validate that will. And then they, the bank knows that the executor named in the will is the true legal representative and they'll pay them the money. But in order to do all that, rather than the court say, oh, we charge a flat fee of $642, the court says, no, we charge a fee based on, or the province on behalf of the court says, you're going to charge the fee based on the value of all the assets that the will governs. So if the assets total a million dollars, it's basically one and a half percent. Right now, you, you don't pay on it. If your estate's worth less than 50 grand, they don't charge a fee. It's called a small estate waiver. But if your estate is worth more than 50 grand, you're going to pay one and a half percent tax uh, in the form of a probate fee. And you can avoid that by various planning, which is beyond the scope of today's uh, interview. The other tax is your income taxes. You have to pay your income tax bill. And the tax that that is ugly and creeps up on death is capital gains tax. So the other tax, that capital gains tax creeps up because you're deemed to have sold all your assets on death. Whether or not, obviously you're not selling your home when you die, maybe you're leaving it to somebody, but you have to pay capital gains tax on your cottage, for example, so uh, or your stock portfolio. So that is a tax that has to be paid on death. And I think I at this point I want to mention a planning issue that really catches a lot of states by surprise and one that is subject to a lot of litigation. You have to remember that uh, certain assets left to certain people carry 
a different tax liability and it's, it's unclear who's to pay the tax, the beneficiary or the estate. So it's important when making your will that you clarify, you know, I'm leaving my cottage to my grandkids and they shall pay the tax <clears throat> owing by my estate. Because the tax comes out of the estate and those who get what's left are the ones that ultimately are paying for that tax. So you can have assets going out to certain beneficiaries and it's unclear. At least the default is, well, your estate pays the tax. So, you know, the common example is, a, is a, a, an RRSP. You leave it to your daughter and then, you know, they're getting the, the planned proceeds, but the estate who's going to your son is paying the tax. So it's important to marry up the tax with the, res, the true recipient beneficiary. That can become a little bit complicated, so the help of a, a good lawyer is something that's really worth the while yeah. to uh, work out all of those things. Uh, yeah, I always like to putting. say that, you know, there's no such thing anymore as a simple will in a complex world. You, you have blended families, more blended families. Um, you have more complicated assets, you know, 50 years ago, we didn't have registered savings plans, TFSAs. You have different types of pension plans. You have different types of life insurance products. You have contractual arrangements, you know, that exist and more, that are more prevalent today. You have an aging mind. You have a society that's more, that behaves more entitled. Um, you have all kinds of dynamics going on that, that how can we possibly say a will is simple when everything is so much more complicated so you know that's why I say that I always say a simple will won't cut it in a complex world. You mentioned blended families that uh, springs to mind a question about um, revisiting a will so a uh, will is something a document that you should revise over the course of your life? Yes uh, you you know you, as your circumstances change, you get remarried or you begin living common law or you separate or you inherit. Those are circumstances that should prompt you to update uh, your your will. Um, and I mean some things are obvious, right? You 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 get in a you know I don't I always like my clients to take. A step back you know the old the old the old prudent advice that you're upset with someone and you right away you type an email and the rule of thumb is no wait 24 hours before you send it or 36 hours and then you know cooler heads prevail and you decide not to send it well <clears throat> I get clients that you know they have a, a nasty argument and they're, they're not here in 24 hours but they're here a week later and, uh, you know, I really get them to take a second look at that whole ar arrangement again and rethink it and don't make a rash, quick split decision. You know, you might intend to go back and change your will, but oftentimes it's procrastinated and you reconciled and yet your old will prevails. You know, we can't, as lawyers, mark everything for follow-up. You know, did you get to back together? Are you speaking with your daughter now? Should we change your will? So, you know, usually we like to see a prolonged period of, you know, where, where it's irreparable, likely it's irreparable, the relationship, before we, you know, clients make that rash decision to cut somebody out. Well, those, those are some circumstances where there's an argument with a family member and someone, uh, there's a break in the relationship and someone wants to write someone out of the will. But uh, circumstances such as divorce, remarriage, uh, and as you mentioned, inheriting uh, property, it is necessary to update your will over time. It's not, I did this in 1990 uh, or I did it in 2020 and that's it. I don't have to look at it anymore. Exactly. I mean, the rule of thumb is every five years, but some people it's not even 20 years. People get older and circumstances change and you should update it. What we've been speaking about uh, wills and leaving your estate, your property to 
those that your beneficiaries after you pass on. But uh, what about transferring those assets before that eventuality? Yes, and that's often overlooked. And <clears throat> I, I let me describe the scenario. I mean, if somebody is, you know, terminally ill, so. Again, there's a very short window here. I'm, I'm sure you're aware of friends or colleagues or, or whomever, family, who were given a terminal illness diagnosis and you know maybe given uh, two to five years. And uh, lo and behold, at the two-year mark, they completely decline and they pass. And so if you can't wait, you know, uh, as you wait and you're... Uh, regimen of, of medicines change and it can impair your ability to make decisions and you may not be testamentary you may not have testamentary capabilities so if you're you have a terminal diagnosis you can begin to advance your estate before you die to save that probate tax and it's helpful because if you don't leave an estate to be tied up if people are going to challenge it it becomes uh, what, what you know harder to challenge um, and you save that one and a half percent but again it's not the end of the world to save one and a half percent so in, in isolated cases <clears throat> clients have the opportunity especially now with um, made legislation or what we commonly refer to as doctor assisted uh, uh, death you can plan your affairs to avoid leaving an estate and paying that tax. But it's very dangerous, I think, for an 80, you know, something uh, parent to decide in perfect health to say, oh, I'm going to give my, I'm going to put my house in my son's name and my bank account. I'm going to put my daughter on. I mean, <clears throat> that's a risky proposition because relations could deteriorate. A lot can happen. You may need the money. Like, it's just not it's just not worth it in my view pre-gifting in that situation uh, I think it's important for everybody to have the ability to control their wealth to the to the end lots of situations can arise I mean um, you have to really really trust your heirs that they'll look after you they won't put you in a two-star long-term care facility when you could afford a five-star because ultimately you know that which they don't spend on you will be left to them right so um, <clears throat> again there's a lot of overstating that and there is a I think it's important to mention that there's a lot of misinformation about uh, well I'm going if I go into a nursing home if if I don't have any assets the government will pay for it all that's that's completely misunderstood um, <clears throat> you know the difference between when the, the type of room you would have for the government to be pay for paying it all is not a room you'd want. People in this province who are in a long-term care facility where the government is paying for everything are not even in a, in a you know, again, I know the health, the long-term care industry is under a ton of criticism, but in my view <clears throat> is not a room that you would want to live out uh, the remaining part of your years in okay so save your money keep it in your name and give yourself at least a five-star room that's uh, a rich food for thoughts <laughs> that that whole that whole scenario there okay Adam my final question is concerning uh, the executor or the trustee the, uh, you must have that when you have a will or when um, that obligation uh, arises after someone passes. What should go into considering uh, who the name? to choose? Yes, as a trustee. That's a great question to end on. A lot of clients think that their executor should be their eldest daughter. Why? Because she's the eldest, and because she's. Uh, a, a NASA astronaut and <clears throat> that is completely false 
uh, nothing against anyone who has a daughter who's an astronaut. It's clearly the daughter is is intelligent, um, but if she's an ASA astronaut, she lives outside the country, and that's not a good idea. Uh, but more than anything else, you, you have to look at who you trust, and who you trust means. Uh, someone might be trustworthy, but they have a life circumstance that makes them not so reliable. You know, I often say that trustworthy is one thing, reliability is another. You know, if you're so unreliable, it borderlines on being not trustworthy. Meaning that if you're busy and you're a, a jet setting executive with an international corporation, are you really going to have the time? <clears throat> to properly report to the other interests in the estate. And so having being available, being trustworthy, being accessible, um, and being unconflicted are of paramount importance. By unconflicted, I mean if you've been lending your executor money throughout periods of time and they potentially owe money to your estate, now you're putting them in a position where they have to also, you know, it's the fox in charge of the hen house. How do you, how do you, how do you do that? I mean, you, you want them to be completely transparent in what they owe the estate. And if they're a potential debtor to the estate, they really shouldn't be in a position to be in charge of the estate. So <clears throat> it's not about being the oldest. It's not about being the highest uh, in post-secondary education. Um, it's about being available and trustworthy. Have a primary because you may need a backup. Primary may get sick. Primary may be caught by surprise. We don't want that. We always tell people, let them know they're named. And it's like anything else. If you ever ask anybody, would you be the guardian of my children? Most people will say yes. Most people haven't a clue what it requires to raise children. Most people have a clue what it requires to double their family size. So everybody says yes, is my point. But when reality sets in, they really don't want to do it. So, you know, be very careful in your selection. There are institutions that will act. They're, you know, they charge, but let's face it, they don't get sick. They've got experience. They're always available. And if they don't do a good job, you don't feel bad suing them. Whereas, you know, you're putting, I always like to say to, to clients, let your sister be an aunt to your daughter. Don't also put them in a position to be their banker and their, their caregiver of money. Okay, because it's, it's an awful position to put them in. Let, let your sister be the sounding board when, the, when your daughter wants to buy a Porsche conver convertible and the bank says, no, that's not a wise use of your money, rather than the aunt saying, it's not a wise use of your money. <clears throat> so <clears throat> those are my practical tips for appointing an executor. Thank you very much for that, Adam. So those were my questions. Was there anything that we have not touched on that you think uh, would be important to add as we round off this discussion on legal issues uh, concerning estate planning and wills? There's, you know, the old adage, you get what you pay for. So when you go to consult with a lawyer, if you if you pick up the phone and call law firm A and law firm A, you say how much for a will, and they say you know three hundred dollars, and then you call law firm B and they say five hundred dollars, and then you decide you're going to go with law firm A. If you think about it, professional services, legal professional services, are based on compensating for time spent. So the less you pay, expect that the less time will be spent. So you ultimately will get what you pay for. And I often leave clients in settings like this with this thought. If you own a home, you insure your home. And you insure it by paying a premium once a year. And you really don't shop that premium around. And if you have, you know that it's pretty, it's pretty much a commodity. It's, it's same A to B to C in terms of insurance companies with a small variance. And you pay that every year to insure the structure of your home from 
fire loss, which is a very remote event. Death is a certain event. Death will occur. So why do you get worried about paying 300 versus 3,000 for a will when you pay it once every 10 years, hopefully, and you know it's going to come into play? Whereas we write checks for ins property insurance like without even thinking. So prioritize where you spend your money and get a proper will done. Uh, I like how you put it. <laughs> that, that, that really, um, you know, it's a bit promotional. It's a bit promotional. <laughs> yes, you're, you're good at that. But, you know, honestly, um, put in that light, I can see, I can see your point 100%. Yeah. And I hope that our viewers do as well. Today, we have been speaking with Adam Capelli. He is a founding partner of the law firm Cambridge LLP. And we have been speaking about estate planning and uh, specifically making your will to take care of those end of life issues. Thank you so much once again, Adam, My for pleasure. being with us and sharing the rich, rich information that you have. I am Celia Sanka, Executive Director of the Diversity Canada Foundation, the organization that brings you GoldenVoices.com and the Golden Years Fireside Chat series. Join me next time for another edition in the series. Until then, take good care of yourself. Bye for now.